Hey everyone, today we're going to be talking about a cool concept called sample size. Now, even if you've never picked up a math textbook, you do know what sample size is. Roughly, it's like the number of people who leave reviews for a restaurant. It might be the number of animals you collect in the wild if you're a researcher. Maybe it's the number of people that respond to your survey. It's just the number of things you have that you're going to base all your future analysis off of. It's also pretty clear why it's important if you're deciding between two restaurants and they both have a four-star review on average, but I tell you that the first restaurant that's based on 10 reviews and the other is based on 10,000, two very different stories there. So it's clearly very important. And so today we'll be talking about a similar situation. The exact one is that you are working at a company and you just released a new energy drink called Staterade. Now before this you had an energy drink called Matherade and based on extensive testing, extensive surveys, you're very confident that the average rating of the old drink is two stars on a scale of one to three. So we'll be keeping things a little simpler today um, so people can give either a one, two, or three star review. And you know that Matherade has an average two star rating. The big question, the first and foremost question, is that your team's goal is to figure out whether the new drink you just released is better or worse on average than the old drink. And as the resident data scientist, the team comes to you and says that if we want to answer this question with a high degree of confidence, what is the minimum sample size that we need? This idea of minimum sample size is pretty important in many, many situations, but here, for example, you don't want to have too few samples because you probably don't have much confidence in the results, but you also don't want to have that many more samples than you need because each sample in this case is a person that you need to recruit and get them to try your drink and give the review, so that's time and money and resources that um, you want to avoid spending too much of. So the question is, can we find a good kind of range where we get enough confidence, but we're also not wasting our resources? And that's it. There's no more slides after this. So the crazy thing right now, if you're the data scientist at least, is that you have zero data to go off of. I mean, the team hasn't told you anything specifically, and this is kind of how it goes in the real world a lot of times. Um, people will have general questions like this, like, is the new drink better? And what's the sample size you need? But they don't necessarily have a ton of data for you. So it's your job to get creative about it and come up with a robust and defensible analysis and help answer this question. So let's hop over to the code and see how we might answer this. All right, so here we are at the code. It'll be made available to you in the description below. And the first part is just recapping what we just learned. So the question again, is the average rating of the new drink better or worse than the average rating of the old one? And the question for you, the data scientist, is what is the sample size needed to precisely answer this question, where even this notion of preciseness is vague? And so as a recap, the old drink had an average rating of two stars. So we don't have anything to go off of, as I've been saying. Um, so why don't we just pick something? It seems like a weird thing to do, but there's nothing else to really do at this point. So let's just come up with a distribution of true ratings for our new drink and assume this is the truth for now. So let's say that 15% of the population at large thinks our new drink is worth one star, 65% think it's worth two star, 20% think it's worth three star. And we can compute the average using some simple math and we get the average rating, if this was the truth, is 2.05 stars, which is just above the two star rating of the old drink. And so the question now is, what is the minimum number of samples we need in order for us to actually realize that this drink is better than the old one, in order for us to see that this 2.05 is higher than the two star rating from before? So let's define a couple of functions to help us along the way. So the first function is called generate ratings, and it does exactly that. It takes in a rating distribution, just like the one above. It takes an n, which is the number of samples we want from that distribution, and it gives us back n samples from that distribution. Um, in more human terms, we are basically saying, hey, if this is the true distribution of ratings for this drink, then give me a sample basically, like for example, if n is equal to 10, give me 10 samples from that distribution, 10 people who rated the drink under that distribution. To make sure it works, um, let's ask for 100,000 samples from that distribution that we talked about above. And if we get the results, we find that 15% of them are one star, 65% are two star, and 20% are three star, which is exactly the result we expected. And the average rating is 2.05. So the function seems to work just fine. So now, for example, let's say, what if our sample size was 10, starting pretty small? So what this next function does, simulate runs, basically does a bunch of simulations of asking for 10 samples from the above distribution. So specifically, this is what's happening. We sample 10 people from that distribution, take their average rating, that's data point number one. 
we sample another 10 people independently. This is a fresh run from that distribution. Take their average. This is the next data point. And we do this many, 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 many times. And then we eventually plot this uh, distribution of what the average rating looks like if we're using 10 people in our sample. The reason it just looks like a bunch of spikes is because when you have 10 people and the only possible ratings are 1, 2, or 3, there's only so many possible values you can have. But as you'll see when we ramp up the sample size, this starts looking more like a true distribution. But let's look at this for a moment. So if we have 10 people, there's a little bit of information here. So we see the average rating is 2.05, just like we expected. But the kind of caution that we're getting is that the standard deviation is around 0.2. We don't like big standard deviations in survey data because it means that we're not very sure about that average rating. It could be that the average rating is true, but if we have a big standard deviation, then there's a lot of uncertainty about exactly what the truth is in this situation. The key number we'll be looking at for this video is actually the bottom one, which is called percent distribution. Um, let me try to explain this the best I can here. So we know that the true average rating under this distribution is 2.05. This percent distribution, which says 50%, says that 50% of the time we did this simulation that I just talked about above, 50% of the time we get that the average rating from those 10 people is actually higher than 2, is higher than our old drink. So 50% of the time we can say that it's higher than the old drink, and the other 50% of the time we say that it's lower than our old drink's average. Clearly not a good situation. We don't want to leave this answer up to a 50-50 coin flip. And the reason that we're Getting this kind of bad, this uncertainty here is because our sample size is so small. Even though the truth is that the new drink is better under this distribution, our sample size is too small to accurately tell us that. So let's ramp up the sample size to 100. So if we do that and uh, repeat the exact same steps as above, we get this distribution here. So it looks a little funky because we should play with the bin size, but you get the idea. It looks more like a true distribution now. And more importantly, looking at this percent distribution number, we find that now 77% of the time, the average we get from these 100 people is actually higher than 2, which again is the average rating of our old drink. So we're getting more certainty now. 77% is better than 50%. But maybe it's still not as good as it could be. So let's ramp up the sample size one more time to 1,000. Repeat all that, and we get this distribution here. Now we find that more than 99% of the time, so in more than 99% of these simulated runs, we get that the average rating is actually higher than 2. So we get the truth 99, more than 99% of the time, and so we probably want a sample size between 100 and 1,000. Maybe we can try a couple in that range and see what leads to a percent distribution number we're comfortable with. And so it took quite a few samples in this situation for us to get a good degree of certainty. And the key reason for that is because this average rating of 2.05 is pretty close to the thing we're comparing it against, which is the average rating of 2. And when you have two things that are really close, it takes a lot of samples for us to fully realize that difference. So let's look at this other situation. Let's say that backtracking, instead of assuming that true distribution above, we assume this very different looking true distribution where 5% of people think it's 1 star, 50% think it's 2 star, and 45% think it's 3 star. The average rating now is 2.4 stars, which is much higher than 2, not just a little bit higher than 2. So let's repeat the above with 10 people in our sample. And we find that with even just 10 people in our sample, already in 97% of the runs, we are getting that the average from these 10 people is higher than 2. And the reason it takes such smaller sample size in this situation is because the true average in this case, in this assumed distribution, is much, much higher than 2. So it doesn't take a lot of people for us to realize that. So we have these vague notions going on now. We get these vague notions that Obviously, increasing the sample size increases confidence, but it also depends somewhat on what is the actual difference between our old drink and the new drink. If that difference is small, we need a lot more samples than if that difference is big. So this is cool. This is definitely pretty cool. But now what do we do as the data scientist with this whole framework? We do exactly what it says here. We can try out a bunch of different true distributions because, again, we don't know which one is the actual truth. So let's just try a bunch of them. And for each one, we see how the required sample size changes. So the key elements of the code that I'll direct you to is this outer for loop. It's iterating over all the possible different distributions of ratings, assuming that that one is the truth during each run. And once we fixed one of those rating distributions, this inner for loop goes over a bunch of different possible sample sizes and does exactly this histogram analysis, this density analysis that we were doing above. 
and the number I've chosen here is 95%. So what that basically means is that we are going to stop uh, checking sample sizes when this percent distribution is at least 95%. In more intuitive terms, that means that at least 95% of the simulated runs are giving us the truth about this distribution being better or worse on average than our old drink. And so we do that, and this was the best way I could think of to collect all those results. So let me walk you through this diagram here. The x-axis is the P1 fraction, which is the uh, proportion of people that think our drink is worth one star. And the y-axis is P2 fraction, which is the proportion of people that think our drink is worth two stars. The reason we don't have a P3 fraction is because since there's only three possibilities in this case, they have to add up to one. So once you pick a P1 and P2, the P3 is just one minus those two. Um, so how do we interpret this? Um, I should have reduced my font size a little bit. Um, so let me try and explain what's going on here. So let's look at this 25, for example, that my mouse is over. This is saying that if 20% of people think your drink is one star and 20% of people think your drink is two stars, and that would imply that 60% think it is three stars, then we just need a sample size of 25 in order for us to confidently answer whether the new drink is better or worse than the old one. Now by contrast, let's look at this 250. It's kind of running into this other 250, but this says 250 right here. This says that if 30% of people think that it's one star and 30% of people think it's two star and therefore 40% of people think it's um, three stars, then we actually need 250 samples in order to confidently answer this question. And to further interpret this, this blue line you see running through this graph is all the possible P1, P2, P3 combinations where the average rating is exactly two. The reason that along this line you see all these negative ones is that we can never have enough samples in this case. We're never gonna have enough samples because if the average rating of our new drink is exactly the average rating of our old drink, then the distributions are basically gonna be on top of each other and you're never gonna be able to have enough samples to say if it's better or worse. And that also explains why the closer you are to this line, which means that the closer your true average is to the old drink's average of two, the more samples you need. So that's again going back to that situation where that 2.05 average was pretty close to that two average. And the further away you get from that line, you might need as few as five samples to really answer this question. And now what do we do with this? We go back to our team and we ask them, for example, here are all the possible different sample sizes you might need. Now let's brainstorm what are the most probable um, true distributions for our new drink because not all of these are equally likely. We might have done a little bit of focus groups before or have a vague idea about what the distribution would look like. And so maybe the team tells you that we vaguely strongly believe that between zero and 20% of people think it's going to be one star. And so that corresponds to this green highlighted region here. And if we look only within the green highlighted region, then we see that the biggest sample size we would really need is 100, maybe around 250. but. Um, on the smaller side than stuff that's outside of this region. And so that's what we would do. Maybe we would choose a sample size of 100 based on this analysis. So the key thing I wanted to get across in this video is just that even with no information, you can still do a lot. You can still bring something to the table that is uh, robust, defensible, and allows you to have a solid action plan going forward. And now here's the part where I drop in all the mathematical buzzwords that would have just made this confusing if I talked about them before. But this, uh, the first part of what we did with the simulations, basically a Monte Carlo method, doing a bunch of simulations, a bunch of simulated runs. And this final part we did is pretty much a Bayesian analysis where we ask our team about what's our prior understanding about how likely we are to have been any of these true distributions. And they kind of say that the most likely place to be is in this green band. And based on that, we make some kind of decision. So this was a Bayesian analysis, this was a Monte Carlo method, but like none of that matters. I think that's just making it confusing. At the end of the day, we're just doing a smart defensible analysis to get at possible sample sizes in this situation. So uh, hopefully you learned something in this video. If you did, like and subscribe, um, leave any comments below, and catch you next time.